I want to play one of the videos that I had that was kind of highlighting what Captain and Co is beforehand because I was in one of their like streamer clash cups. So let's jump over and see what that gameplay looked like. If you click F next to it, you grab balls and then you can go up to a cannon and then you can reload it. Here's a quick video of me and my friends trying Captain and Company. So you fire the cannon and then you grab those to reload. Yeah, yeah don't be noobs, guys. Come on, wake up here. Oh, I think All we ships got it. Are full? We got it. My, it says join. It said we join fail. That's not right. You can't throw your friends overboard. Don't treat your friends I'm like that. Bro, you yeah. can't mutiny against your crew. That's it goes crazy. The other way. This is the state of crypto gaming in 2023. It's connecting. I'm in, but I don't see it. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, 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 here we go. Yeah. Hold okay, you guys, don't me. load the we're ship. In. Don't load. Hold on. We're in, we're in, we're in. We're in? Are we're in. Are we? I only see two of you. Are you going to go left or right? It's, it's all ships are full. <laughs> oh, no. I'm in, I'm in. Okay, well. Yeah. All right, we're flying at people here. Go left no, side. Get left. go straight. You have to pull yeah. that side. What do you mean? No, bro, we're going straight at him. Okay. Yo, actually, hold on to our right. You see that to the right? You see that to the right? The full ship there? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pulling to the left here. I don't know how to slow down. I can't slow down. Yo, this sink is the, the one in front of us just sunk. Yo, we're getting boys. We're getting hit. I don't know what we're doing. We're right next to these guys. Look to the left. Fire. Fire the cannons, Danny. Oh my God, they're almost dead. We're going I'm after them. I'm, I'm, I'm going back. I'm going back. Watch out! Watch out! Watch out! No, we're going after them. We're going after them, brother. You hang. You hanged me off, bro. You hanged Yo, I'm me sorry. Off. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There, 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 there. You're at the side. Oh no, they're turning around. Yo, we're gonna we're gonna end up colliding in them. I'm trying to get right in front of their path. Yeah, yeah, left side, left side, left side. I'm hitting them. I'm hitting them good. Yo, I'm angling to the left. I'm angling to the left. <laughs> Damn. Oh, taking big hits. We're taking big yeah, hits. We're taking show. big hits. We're about to die, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, I don't even know what one to go off of here. There's one boat that's straight ahead of us. You want to? You want me to go in that? Oh shit! You're right. You're right. Hold on. Hold on. Oh, no, we're dead. We're dead. It's been over. Okay, we're in. Is everybody here this time? I'm gonna try Let's to slow down. I'm slowing down. I'm slowing down. Yo, we're pulling up. We're pulling up besides these guys. Get oh, ready. One, seven, eight, nine. Ouch! We be needing help. Yo, we move. Yo, oh, we're sailing, boys. We're, we're pressing forward. Oh shit! Yo, we here. Oh, yo, just keep fighting. Yo, we, we sunk, sunk them. Yo, right in front of us, oh, to the oh, right. Oh, that oh, one oh, in front of us. Oh, oh, the one right in front of us. To the right. 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 I'm slowing down. To the right. To the right. Okay, so that was that was a little bit of a preview of how the game looked before. Let's get Dash Capitalist in here, who's down in the chat as well. And yo, Harry, good morning. And Tolly True, JVP was cooking. Yo, Dash, how's it going, boss? Hey, Shelly, great to hear from you, man. Uh, my sound coming through okay? Yeah, yeah, you're right? good. You sound golden. So, okay, we just played a quick little video. I saw you in the Twitch chat, so I think you saw <laughs> the replay of that. But so yep. this game is a pirate game where you're taking the the seven seas, if you will. Uh, you're doing it with your friends. Give us a little bit of a lowdown of what Captain and Company is. Yeah, of course, man. Look, hey, we when we built Captain and Company, we wanted to take the best parts of all the existing pirate games out there. You know, your Assassin's Creed Black Flag, your Sea of Thieves, you know, stuff like that. We wanted to condense it into a super casual, friendly, quick play format that really just gets to the heart of being a pirate ASAP. So when, when you play Captain and Company, you are a pirate, you are owning the ship, you go out there and you try to blow up, you know, everybody else's ships in real time combat. You try to steal their nuggies and you try to get out and we built it in a way where it's you know completely first person it's a real you know pirate simulator you really can control the sails control the ship aim the cannons you know repair etc um, and all of that is really tied together with a really robust web3 ownership framework where those ships that you guys are sailing on those are real pirate ships so captain and company is um, you know it's it's a, a passion project from a bunch of old mobile devs uh, who originally had some massive hits back in 2014 2015 uh, you know to the tune of 100 million plus downloads across a couple titles so um, it's a it's a very storied studio uh, with a really really comprehensive game plan here for how to get uh, the most accessible gameplay 
out to the Web3 crowd in the most unique way possible. And I think that to date, uh, we've had crazy good adoption. Um, I know we, we've had we've had you out played a couple times. I'm super glad that you enjoyed it so much. It was a blast to have you out there. Uh, and even just yesterday, we had a, a massive creator clash, you know, with folks like Spike, Orangey, Cairo, et cetera, a whole bunch of other gang. And um, yeah, the the consensus is really strong. So we we've we've been super proud to uh, to have our pirates out there and uh, and everybody having a blast. So I'm kind of thinking we're probably going to shoot for about 45 minutes to an hour. So if you're down, I want to kind of dissect different components of this entirely. And one of the main things is why did you choose to go with the Web3 route? Because we're seeing a lot of people saying, you know, hey, yeah, Web3 is the future. But at the same time, a lot of people saying just create a good game. Why the hell do you need Web3 integration? That's a great question. Look, uh, pirates at their core honestly embrace the Web3 ethos. I can't think of a better theme to fit Web3 than pirates. And the reason that is, is because pirates are all about owning your own assets, putting up your own risk, going out there, levering up, trying to find you know an edge over someone else. And so when we designed Captain & Company, we built it around an original thesis piece that I wrote uh, probably two or three years ago titled Gladiators and Lumberjacks. And that separates all Web3 players into a simple dichotomy. You have people who are risk on, those are your gladiators, those are people who want to take incremental risk by owning assets, and they want to hit those big rewards even if they lose sometimes. And then on the other hand, you have your lumberjacks, and those are people who never want to take any risk. Those are your airdrop farmers. Those are your grinders, the people who just want to earn. And so inside of Web3, you have that dichotomy of people, and it's a very difficult question from a game design perspective to try to come up with a comprehensive gameplay design that gets both those people not just in the same room, but actively cooperating and strategizing together where there is real synergy between like a whale and a minnow and why do those two need each other? So from our perspective, Captain & Company is one of the very few games that needs blockchain because it does lean in so hard into this notion of very real user ownership. When you have a ship inside of Captain and & Company, uh, and when we turn repairs back on, when you are sunk, that is real risk. That is real cost to you. And similarly, on the other side, if you are not a captain and you're just on somebody else's ship and you're going around and you're having fun, you have absolutely no risk, but you have very limited you know, upside inside of the game. And so to us, when we were both designing a game that would fit uh, you know, this, this thesis around a dichotomy of Web3 players where you have gladiators and you have lumberjacks, to us, pirates were so patently obvious that like this was the theme that we needed to build and capture just because on all pirate ships right throughout history like the the way it works is you have the one guy in charge you have the literal whale who is the captain and then you have everyone else who's there to support him right and so to us we built this game from the ground up with every feature tuned in to that reality that you're going to have people who own things inside of, uh, you know, inside of Web3 and the broader digital asset ecosystem, you're going to have those big owners, and then you're going to have a plethora of folks who don't own anything. And we don't want to, you know, exclude either party. We want to build a game that actively celebrates both ends of the spectrum and really brings them together to, you know, leverage the synergy on both sides. So the, you know, the net question of like, why blockchain? I think there's always a lot of ways that, you know, games can go about explaining this, but to us, uh, honestly, there's no way that this would work without blockchain because that nature of real ownership, real risk, real piracy, it's so intrinsic to the theme that actually owning your digital assets is just the way that this game feels best. So when you're talking about the high risk, high reward, is that kind of the only way to play of like every time you go in, you have to risk something? No, actually. So uh, season two is coming up here in about 30 days, and we haven't actually unveiled the feature roadmap, but I'll tease a little bit of it here. Um, right now, the game is in what I would describe as only up mode. So we recently won Blast's mainnet launch, uh, their Big Bang contest. I can dig in more about what Blast is because that is a whole other can of worms that we can get into, but it's awesome. Uh, we won their whole mainnet launch contest, and so we have an ongoing airdrop of a ton of stuff. And what that means is we've disabled repairs, we've disabled any penalties, any loss inside of the whole game. Basically, at this point, anyone who owns a ship, you can hop in, you can be a captain, go blow up a bunch of other people, collect a bunch of M blast, and then, you know, escape. And you can bring all your friends along with you. And if you don't own a ship, you can also just as easily join one of the, you know, active 20, 30, 40 captains who are constantly playing the game, you know, trying to farm up this M blast. So, um, you know, the net answer to your question is, 
Uh, there is this hardcore mode to the game where you can opt in to this very real risk and very real upside. But then there's also like a much softer, more casual side to the game where you can just, you know, go in, farm these blast rewards while the campaign is ongoing through May, uh, you know, and get a really good feel for the game. And I, I kind of teased a little bit of season two here, and uh, I, I don't want to spoil it too much for our engineers, but a lot of what we're doing in the season two design is asking ourselves, you know, how can we tie together a more careful, casual mid-core experience and then have people opt in into a more hardcore experience down the line? So you're going to have more features coming out, things that are a little bit more PvE friendly, perhaps, uh, things where you take the resources that you might get inside of those PvE experiences and then, you know, lever those into much larger PvP type battles. So um, we're building Captain and Company to address a very, very large mid-core casual audience. We don't want folks to come in and think like this is going to be rust or something, right? We're like, oh my God, it's like super hardcore. Instead, we really want people to come in, be able to immediately have fun, immediately like relax, get into the pirate spirit, and then push that as hard as they want to in the spectrum of risk, and then take that upside when they're victorious on that risk spectrum. So I want to go a little bit more into the blast. And I, I guess if we can talk like more broadly to not just specifically for captain and company, because, you know, for uh, what I do every single day and for anybody that's tuned in, if this is your first time hanging out, love having you here. We go live every single day, Monday through Friday, and we normally just go over uh, tweets on the timeline, give some of my own perspectives with it. And one of the frequent occurrences as of late is people commenting about blast saying, oh, it's not the experience that I wanted. Why are we doing this? There's these other L2s. There's, you know, you get the bridge to blast and then you have 605 other things you have to put yield into and i feel like there's almost like a disconnect between too many options with like what to do even though it's simple right because there's these gold points there's uh just earning yield in general for having tokens on blast uh but i guess what's your kind of general thoughts about blast and its initial launch here if you thought it was really well what could be improved and then if you can go into uh why you guys submitted and kind of chose blast to launch on yeah, so let's break it down real simple. So Blast is an optimistic rollup on ETH, right? And in non-technical terms, that means it's functionally identical to your Arbitrum and your Optimism, right? Very, very similar. Uh, Blast brings two new things to the table that no other chain is currently doing. The first one is that they're refunding at least the L2 fee component of gas transactions. So that's great. So that means that part of the gas that you spend will come back to the smart contract owners themselves. And a lot of people are doing clever things there. They're either monetizing their games via gas transactions, uh, or they're refunding gas back to users, or they're staking the gas and then returning the yield to the users. Um, we are exploring with sponsoring all user transactions and just keeping the gas refund so that everything becomes, you know, uh, at least partially free. Um, and then the second thing that Blast is doing that's really unique is they're enabling native yield on all stable coins and ETH on the chain. And so that means that instead of, you know, on normal ETH or Arbitrum, et cetera, you would take your USDC and you would go and you would put it, you know, inside of Compound or Aave or something, right, and get yield on it there. On Blast, you don't do that. On Blast, you can just leave it inside of your wallet and it will automatically compound and rebase over time at exactly the same rate that MakerDAO is passing through as well as Lido. Now, there's some complexity to this because as you noted, Schiller, like the, you, a lot of people over there, all the farming is you know going into DeFi protocols. And so the natural next question is, well, look, if these things are just naturally compounding in the wallet, why am I putting them into DeFi? Now, the answer is that those DeFi protocols can do certain things on the back end and either re-lever up those tokens into other protocols or use them to farm their own governance token or, and the most important part, use them to farm what Blast is calling Blast Points. And so as you participate in dApps on the Blast ecosystem, you have the chance to become a part-time owner of that ecosystem by way of generating Blast Points, which will then ultimately be converted to Blast sometime in May which is what the Blast team has communicated. So at a high level, right, like you have a chain infrastructure, which is fundamentally similar to, you know, Arbitrum, Optimism, et cetera. But then you have these kind of unique features around the partial gas rebates, as well as uh, the, uh, the native yields into all contracts and wallets. And what those do is jointly really open up a lot of weird design space. Um, and so for example, from a game design perspective, we at Captain and Company are not a DeFi protocol, and we don't intend to have to be a DeFi protocol at any time. However, because Blast's contracts natively accrue yield, it's very simple for us to simply set up 
a staking program that passes that yield on. All people have to do is deposit into a valid contract, which has been connected to Blast, and then we can pass through the yield that's hitting our contracts natively over to those users. And so that's opened up like all this crazy space where now we didn't even plan to have this, but now we have a full staking portal where people can deposit their stable coins, ETH or CAP tokens. And with that, not only are they getting the Blast points that they would normally get across Blast, they're not also getting their APR that they would get for staking uh, Ether stablecoins in general. And then on top of that, we can also issue them our own additional Blast, which we got from winning Blast Contest, and we can also give them in-game rewards for staking with us. And so it, it, it gets to this really weird spot where it's like, well, you know, what is DeFi? What isn't DeFi all of a sudden? Because everything on Blast is just natively DeFi. And so even us, who are a game and completely separate normally from DeFi, even us, we have a full staking portal. And within minutes of opening it, you know, like hundreds of thousands was deposited and people are actively farming. And it's actually a fantastic opportunity to get, you know, a good shot at our Blast allocation. So the the net is that just Blast is a, a weird chain where they've thought really far outside the box about, like, how can we push the boundaries on what should be considered normal? Um, and I, I honestly do think that going forward, you're going to see a ton of chains really try to adopt this native yield strategy because... I, I think that Blast did a phenomenal job with that one out of the gate. Um, and the gas rebates, honestly, uh, they've been about middling, I would say. I, I think that they're less than we expected, but they're um, they're not zero, I suppose. So that's a, a good synopsis of the whole Blast situation. I was ama- Listen, I don't know if you're a teacher, but I, I'd listen to your university courses if you had any. That was amazing. <laughs> so the, the next few things here is, you know, for you with Captain and Company, you ended up winning the competition for Blast, and now you are a part of this ecosystem. Is it something where, you know, we see with Arbitrum, they're trying to highlight, like, all of their games collectively, and I, to be honest, I don't know if a lot of them work together, but have you kind of seen, hey, yeah, now that we're on Blast, we're getting reached out to from other uh, protocols and whatnot launching on there, or is it kind of, hey, we're a part of this and getting, you know, some extra funding and stuff from them, but we're still kind of, like, within our own lane? Yeah, you know, I I think right now the Blast ecosystem is still very young, right? So, I mean, we're running um, weekly Twitter spaces for gaming in particular every Friday at 12.30 p.m. EST. So anyone who's interested in those, you can tune into all things Blast gaming each Friday. Um, And on top of that, what we're really trying to do is, um, you know, invite other games to consider Blast as a locale. I think that right now we are... There are, there are, I think, maybe three or four games tops that I can list that are actually on Blast and live at this point. And I think of those, um, there are very few that have like a, a complete game loop where you can actually dive in and play. And so we have a very, very important first mover advantage here where Captain and Company, frankly, even on its own, right, like would be a phenomenal Web 2 game across the App Store. But inside of Web 3, uh, we, we have a, a really, really unique opportunity to kind of push the push the edge here of being one of the first on this chain. So I think, you know, to kind of more succinctly answer your question, uh, there is not a lot of gaming activity on Blast yet. We are by far, you know, I'd say probably the leader in that that capacity. But I think that over time, especially those two elements that I alluded to, um, you know, around partial gas rebates and uh, and the the native yield accruing to the contracts, I think that there's a very strong chance that um, you know some of the more forward looking on chain type games start to take Blast really seriously. You can imagine, for example, a a DeFi Kingdoms type game, right, which was natively always kind of about you know staking and yield in the background. They did a good job of um, you know weaving in the Web three narrative into there. You could imagine something like a DeFi Kingdoms would work really really well on Blast, for example. DeFi Kings was on Arbitrum or so with Treasure. I'm, uh, the name sounds familiar, but I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't remember exactly what it was about. So, you guys, one of the, one of the big takeaways that I had with Blast was when going through that big band competition. I was like, there's nobody that's covering games except for you guys. So, how come there wasn't more people that submitted that were games for Blast, or do you think just the DeFi protocols ended up winning out? Now, to be honest, I think that. Um First of all, game development's hard. <laughs> so I'm going to start the answer. And, you know, launching on a completely untested chain, I mean, that takes some guts. Uh, and so I think that a lot of this is just that most game developers, um, frankly, are not Web3 native. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But they're like, they're very much in their lane. They're like, all right, we're going to get to launch. Here's our roadmap. Uh, we're going to, you know, check the boxes, uh, et cetera. 
on our side, we are an extremely experimental studio. I mean, we, our guys, like we have a, a ninja team of, you know, four or five hardcore studio devs and then plus our back end guys. And amongst those, we, you know, pivot and respond to things extremely quickly. So when we saw the blast opportunity, we were already ideating about like, how can we tie this into a much larger world narrative? Um, and really, really take advantage of, you know, these pretty unique features. So I, I think that it's really just that in general, game devs tend to be a little bit more risk off and that inside of Web3, particularly Web3 gaming, there is so much risk already, like execution risk related to development that it is just, it's a very tough decision to make to jump chain. So um, I think that part of the reason that we we were so early and that we won is that honestly, we were just extremely bold and quick. Uh, I mean, we, we, are, we are finger on the pulse on this side and always watching for something like this. That's interesting that you guys were ready to pounce at the time that it came out and being the seeing the people that are prepared versus not prepared and i mean going back to the game itself let's kind of get into the details for anybody that might be hearing about this for the first time so you have a couple friends i got five of us we all have to go out and then get a ship and then we're able to participate what's kind of from square one how you initially kind of get involved exactly so what you want to do is if you are a free-to-play player you can just hop in, uh, you go capandco.gg and click the play button. You can play this thing on browser, PC, um, or Mac, uh, as well as Android. And so this thing is super cross-platform. It's probably the most cross-platform game at this point inside of Web3 at this level of quality. Um, you can just hop in and go on anyone's ship. So, you know, live on stream right now, you can literally just walk in, walk up to the shack on the right side, uh, and then you'll have, you know, there's probably 20 or 30 different captains over there, each one of those who are completely open to people coming and playing with them. So you as a random user here, you know, you can walk into the shack, uh, you can find a find a ship, join the ship, and you'll be off to the races. If you want to bring your friends, Captain and Company is expressly designed for streamers. So the intention with streamers is that the streamer will own the ship and that all of your friends will just be able to hop on your ship, again, from any device. Uh, we make this super easy. Uh, when you go in and you actually play as a captain, there's a QR code on the top where you can pretty easily just send it over to your friends. It doesn't matter if it's like your aunt or your uncle who's never played a game before. They can literally just scan the code and they'll be teleported onto your ship inside of the game. And it's all those types of, you know, small little quality of life features that we really, really index hard on because we know that games like Among Us, for example, you know, and, um, you know, all these really uh, quick play, super multiplayer friendly games, they won so hard because they were so accessible. And so Captain and Company, it's a really simple game loop. Get in there, get on a pirate ship, blow up some other pirates. And ultimately, it's all about, you know, accessibility and getting people immersed into this world ASAP. So from a new user perspective, first thing you do, if you're free to play, just hop into the game, join someone's ship, you know, get a feel for the cannons, figure out, you know, what uh, what types of ships you like, et cetera. If you are, you know, more of a high roller and you want to take a Web3 stake in the game, go buy a ship and then you're a captain. You get to keep the majority of the rewards that you earn. Uh, you split 10% of those out as payment to your crew members who are on your ship with you. Um, and you, you get to be, you know, kind of one of the high rollers of the ecosystem here. That is amazing that you guys are designing this for streamers in mind. I think that aspect's cool. And it was fun. Like when, when I did that creator clash before having the friends and trying to figure out the uh, the game loop and uh, exactly what to do. So the aspect of kind of growing the game out, how does that look like? Is this something where you guys are like, hey, we're just going to kind of keep plugging along here, doing updates and changes? Or is there any kind of big pushes to get uh, Captain and Company recognized on a grander scale? Oh, we've got... Uh, honestly, enormous plan. So um, we do not have this listed on Google Play, Epic, or Steam yet, and that's actually very intentional. So our intention here is to get the Web3 community super excited about this. We're going to run the whole normal Web3 playbook, right? That's full of the the quests, the streamers, the PFPs, uh, you know, the loot box drops on a quarterly basis, etc. We will have the whole Web3 strategy completely, you know, pared down. Then what we're going to do likely later this year around season three is we're going to do a full global rollout. So after our entire Web 2.5 experience is ironed out, we will do a full global rollout where we'll be on Google Play, Epic and Steam. And so that's going to be, you know, you should imagine that kind of like a Mavia launch, right? Something, something in that capacity. 
Um, and all of this is honestly underpinned by some really crazy tech architecture that we've built that basically allows people to play the entire fully on-chain experience without ever making a wallet. So what you don't see when you join Captain and Company is that a wallet is made on the back end for you and that each one of those transactions in the game, we sponsor it and or subsidize it. Uh, and so when you perform a crafting transaction, what you don't know is that it is actually logged on-chain. And then at the end of the day, uh, you know, you can go and you can extract your assets out to your wallet and so big picture is that right now we are nailing down the first time user experience in the web3 playbook as soon as that's done and that we've finished out more of um honestly some pretty expansive uh gameplay features and updates that we have planned for both season two and season three here that's when we're going to be dropping this on the mainstream stores and really pushing a much much broader global narrative so can you give us a lowdown of what exactly Cap Games is? Obviously, that's the company kind of behind what's building uh, Captain and Co. But this is, you know, I, I'm not super familiar with it, but I have seen some mentions here and there. Yeah, so Cap Games, uh, this is both our, our studio publisher and distributor. And it's kind of a mouthful, but what we do out of Cap is we distribute games on our site, cap.gg. Uh, we are the largest browser distributor inside of Web3. Uh, so we have over 120 plus partnered games on there. And we've also partnered with some pretty flashy folks to bring the heavier, like Unreal type games into the browser as well. So uh, cap.gg itself is a, a big distro suite specifically specializing in mobile and browser. And then behind the scenes, we also have um, the studio, which sits inside of Cap Games and is behind Captain and Company. Damn. So you <laughs> you guys are cooking here. That's crazy. But, you know, within here, it says that you're backed by Samsung, GSR, Polygon, Solana. Are those just extra investment things? Or did you guys think about launching on those chains before you uh, chose to do Blast? Uh, actually, those are no; those are all investments, and it's because uh, we are a fully cross-chain distributor. So we take games from all of those ecosystems and we distribute and publish them. Um, we are probably one of the only groups that has such a cross-chain backing. So what you don't see there is that, in addition to Polygon and Solana, uh, we also have Near, Algorand, and HBar, Sheesh. all of whom have also contributed. Yeah, it, it's actually insane. So basically, every every single major chain who does active investment has invested in us before <laughs> all right so we're we're talking to the big shot here who's got it all done so give me the lowdown <laughs> about you and how you kind of first got into the space maybe a little bit about maybe your runescape days too because this guy's rocking an old school runescape pfp and i started playing again so i'm curious give us a lowdown of your nft journey uh and then maybe a little bit of your runescape one Oh man, I, I love to meet a fellow connoisseur. No, that's awesome. Um, look, I, I, I'm 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 an old school nerd. All right, I I grew up playing everything from RuneScape to Eve to WoW. You know, big MMO, large scale econ fan. Um, I've probably got I think a thousand plus games almost on Steam. So like, I if there's been a game, I've probably played it. Um, but more importantly, I, I came into the Web3 space uh, after I did my PhD in chemistry, which I suppose is, is as you alluded to earlier, where I got the, the teaching chops in. And um, Goldman Sachs pulled me onto their, their clean tech equity desk from there for a little bit. So I did a bunch of work for them and ultimately decided, frankly, that Web3 was a little bit more exciting. So I bailed out of Goldman, um, ultimately joined um, Hivemind, which is a, a large um, investment firm where I actually do still lead venture, in particular in the gaming segment. And we raised a little bit over a billion dollars on that side. And at the same time, as I joined Hivemind, I started Cap. And so Cap is uh, effectively, you know, our big bite out of both game development, distribution and publishing. And the objective, you know, really has just been to lever um, my entire subset of experiences across both, you know, personally participating in venture, uh, you know, personally building companies and helping folks build companies in gaming, uh, as well as obviously my expansive hobbyist interest in, in seeing all this stuff work. So my, my path here is a little bit strange. I, I don't know how many... Uh, you know, chemistry nerds actually end up here. Funnily enough, I think IMX's head of venture is also a, a biochem PhD. So maybe there's a couple of us. Um, but uh, yeah, suffice to say, look, it, it, the, the reason that I'm here is we've done a ton of, you know, personal research as well as venture research and venture deployment in specifically this segment. And honestly, we think that gaming is just the one that's probably going to take it home the most over this next two year period. So... 
I want to ask a question that might be a little strange, but I've been arguing with people in my comments because <laughs> I, I, I post like shorts on TikTok, YouTube, whatever. And, and normally those get pushed out to just whoever. It's not necessarily a specific audience. And a lot of people still say that NFTs are a scam. Crypto is a scam. And I'm kind of sitting here being like, no, I think this is going to be a new sector. It's just the evolution of things. It might seem a little weird. But what would be your answer to somebody saying that NFTs are gambling? Yeah, you know, I, I think it's 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 obviously very difficult to convince someone who's already got their mindset. But I, I think the most important thing to continue to remind people is that um NFTs, that's that's really just a, a very fancy way of describing a backend technology. I, I mean, realistically, all that we're trying to say with NFTs is that this is a public database. That's it. It's a it's a shared public ledger. And what we're doing with NFTs is we're saying, like, look, if I can publicly prove that I own this thing and you can publicly prove that you sent me cash, then we can trade and we can trade without any third party intermediary. And I mean, that's obviously like a really complicated philosophical thing to go through. But at its base, if you can get someone to the point where they understand that what we're trying to do here is operate without anyone else in the middle, we're not operating, you know, over a Steam marketplace or a Facebook marketplace, or really any other intermediary. It's very much like I own and I hold anything digital. So it's before before we you know started down this whole blockchain road. Uh, there, there was no no essence of what ownership meant in the digital space. You couldn't you couldn't decisively prove that you owned any element uh, that was electronically stored, because the only way that you could do that is if you had a way of simultaneously proving to everyone else in the entire world that you absolutely own this random set of bytes. Uh, blockchain changes that, which is crazy. Like it, it's it's easily one of the biggest fundamental shifts that we've seen in human history. The ability to take something that is fully distributed and electronic and prove that you decisively own it is an absolute paradigm shift. So, you know, to like the normies, if you will, who, who we're, we're trying to very delicately convert over here, the message is very simple. It's before blockchain, it was impossible to prove that you actually owned anything on the Internet. After blockchain, we can now expand what is possible and we can ask ourselves, like, what does it mean to own something that is electronic? Now that we can do that, does it open up any more interesting ideas? And so it's not so much like, oh, I want to trade, you know, uh, my, my monkey JPEGs one for another, right? It's more like what I want to think about is, you know, inside of a game environment or inside of a financial environment. If I don't need any intermediaries and I can prove that I own what I'm physically holding, what does that mean? What does that open up? As we're changing to the revolution or technological advancement here, I'm seeing different conversations from different people. And so recently Brad Garlinghouse was like, who's like the, the founder of Ripple was like, this is great that the markets are back. And now we have to show that, you know, there's actually a revolution here and that things are progressing. I'm curious, is there anything over the past two-ish years that you've either done or seen within the blockchain space that you feel is like actually an advancement? Because, you know, a lot of the time we're, you know, in the front face and as we just discussed, trying to say, hey, this is like a fun spot. It's not gambling. This is just exciting and then you have to be like oh i can back it up and be like ah oh, uh with hat is at a three billion market cap and if you bought this before you would have been rich but there's a lot more <laughs> there's a lot more here to it all right yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna cite three here all right uh, and i'm gonna try to work through each one of these a little bit slowly because these uh these get a little bit complicated all right so the first one is uh Let's take the example of DeFi today, literally right now in this moment. If I were to go over to Aave or Compound and stake my USDT and lend it out to someone programmatically without any over collateralization risk, I will get anywhere between 10 and 20%. If you describe this to a Web2 person, they will say immediately, this must be a Ponzi. That doesn't make any sense. The stock market itself only appreciates between 8 and 15% on average per year. Where is this coming from? And the answer is very simple, that the, 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 the reason you can get 10 to 20% inside of DeFi is because there is organic demand from people who are attempting to borrow and lever that up. 
And the question is, why is this relevant to, you know, like why we need blockchain in the first place? Like, can't we do this in Web2? And the answer is, we do this in Web2. They're called banks. So banks take this side of the bet against financial players all day long. They take the 10 to 20% margin loans constantly. It is why they are making a ton of cash. In this new digital world, we can become the banks and we can do it trustlessly in a way where it's not necessarily dangerous for me to loan a counterparty I've never seen 20, 30, 40 thousand dollars and take the 10 to 20 percent yield on that. That's all because it's secured by these public ledgers and these public smart contracts, which we can easily verify. So that's like that's a crazy paradigm shift. And of course, the banks are terrified of that. That is a terrible prospect for them. If I can have my community set up in a way, literally my neighborhood community set up in a way where we can just loan each other cash instead of having to go get a mortgage at the bank. And for some reason, the house is also electronically secured. That is infinitely better than all of us sitting here and paying out dozens and dozens of millions to the banks, right? As we're all trying to pay down our mortgages or our shorts or whatever it is we're trying to loan against. So number one, it's that DeFi works and DeFi is crazy cool, all right? So that's, a, that's the first weird example. Might be hard to describe to people, but it's really powerful once they understand it. The second example is the nature of actually holding uh, an electronic bearer type asset is what it's called. So normally in the electronic space, you have credit type assets. These are credit entries in your bank. It says your bank owes you $10,000 because that's how much you have in your savings account. The cash is not physically there. You do not physically hold it. The bank also probably doesn't physically hold it. As soon as we have real digital assets, if I hold from me, there is no scenario where those funds can get frozen, they can get lost, the bank can go under because the bank was terribly leveraged to, you know, ridiculous um, uh, commercial uh, building debt or something like a lot of these small regional banks are that are collapsing over the past 12 months. You own that physical bearer type asset and no one can ever claim digital assets and blockchain. You can conceivably create a space where a fully digital world is reasonable and there is not necessarily some middleman who's like, you know, uh, you, you have the sword of truth and I'm going to confiscate your sword of truth now because you, you know, broke some arbitrary rule. Um, it's, it's much, much more similar to reality, which is like, I've been working my whole life to buy and hoard whatever physical things I have around me. These are my physical things, barring any apocalypse, no one's going to take these away from me. So again, it's, you know, it's, it's really just this philosophical shift where people have to get comfortable with the notion that prior to the age of blockchain, there were absolutely zero opportunities for anyone to own anything provably electronically. Everything was a credit type asset. Everything was owned by the banks and or owned by some intermediary. And this is the first time that any individual can participate in a much larger economic experiment where we all directly own our own bearer type assets. You are an encyclopedia of knowledge. Holy moly. This is fantastic. I, I wish I met you earlier in the space. So, okay. You've broken down different aspects of that. And really the ownership is something that when we had Phil on just before you here, he was talking about that too, in his way to describe NFTs. And I think, you know, there's these different games, but arguably what could be this mass adoption for lack of a better term is the world of the metaverse. So I'm curious, what's your take on the metaverse? I'm assuming you've kind of seen what's going on with other side in Yuga. We have Nifty Island that's doing things. Obviously there's Sandbox and Decentraland. So I'm just kind of wondering how, you know, you're focusing on a specific game. Have you looked at all at trying to integrate that to a, a broader metaverse beyond and just your kind of general thoughts on what this metaverse should entail? Yeah, you know, I think the the what is the metaverse question is easily the hardest question to answer inside of Web3 or out. Um, obviously, two years ago, we had Meta, Facebook completely rebrand in that direction and go all in on it. Um, I, I still think that, look, the, the notion of the metaverse will happen, all right? There will be some digital reality, uh, either, you know, controlled by a single corporate entity like Meta and or distributed in some, you know, Web3 uh, paradise. But I think that the, the most important question to ask ourselves is like, if we do choose to move to a reality where everything that we do is digital, right? Where, you know, either we're, we're eating you know, digitally or we're socializing entirely digitally, like our relationships are digital. Um, who is the guardian of that space? And, you know, I, I, I'm fond of these, you know, initial metaverse attempts. Uh, obviously, I, I think that you can't you can't talk about metaverses without mentioning, you know, Second Life and the actual OG metaverses of literally 20 to 30 years ago. 
But I think that the guys who are trying it now, I haven't seen anything that's so compelling, frankly, in like a decentralized capacity where I think it's demonstrably different than some of the early metaverses we had, again, 10, 20, 30 years ago, your, you know, IMVUs, your second lives, uh, you know, stuff in that same category. So, you know, net, I think that the notion of the metaverse directionally, 100%, someone is going to nail this. And I think that ultimately there will probably be exactly one winning corporate metaverse, probably meta, but maybe something else. Um, and then there's probably going to be exactly one winning decentralized metaverse. Um, and, you know, the degree to which we're actually going to be able to accomplish this thing in a decentralized capacity, given the absolute compute constraints of what we're going to need to do, I think is still very TBD. Um, and so, uh, you know, while we're kind of en route there, uh, you know, some of these early metaverse attempts, they're they're nice, you know, games or, or kind of pseudo metaverses, but we're we're not quite there yet where I would I would really pound the table and say that anyone that I've seen today has uh, what I would describe as an actual metaverse. That's insanely naive of me because when you said there was going to be like a corporate metaverse winner, I I don't know why. I didn't even really clue into that aspect, but you're right regarding meta and all that. And it's funny because I felt like when they announced that, they took a whole lot of flack, but now it seems like that narrative is coming back for the metaverse. So what do you think about the cycles here within NFT land where we went from, ah, we, you know, this is, this is digital ownership. We're fine with things that are just, you know, a PFP to... Uh, Ah, guys, we want more things that are utility. And then everybody incorporates some kind of staking that was either good or just for the sake of doing it. And now we're back to, oh, if it's a PFP, it's totally fine. And then I, I feel like we're already starting to shift back to the, okay, we want more from that. And obviously there's going to be, you know, this early wave of adoption that's a little bit awkward. But what's your thoughts on this cycle of back and forth and what people want out of NFTs? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I, I feel like we should actually just plot this cycle because I'm sure that we can find some weird correlation to um, to the market cycle itself. But yeah, look, I, I think that um, my favorite part in NFTs was actually like four to five to six months ago, actually. It felt really good. It felt like there were a lot of grassroots communities who um, a lot of them were doing, you know, like collector or alpha type communities, you know, groups like, uh, you know, the Wolves or, um, uh, you know, Neo Tokyo, like a bunch of these guys, right? Like people were starting these communities left and right. And I, I thought that was really cute. Like that's like a great way to express yourself digitally is like I own a membership of this group and that's all that I know and that's all that I care about. And nobody was too fussed about them until the market came back. And then they were like, well, people are giving these groups money because you know, they have either access or they have members or they have users or they have eyeballs or something. Um, and then all of a sudden those communities, whether or not they planned on it, right, um, found themselves in positions where like, wow, we can financialize this. So I, I think that it, it obviously, you know, moves and is probably a little bit delayed versus the, the actual, um, you know, market cycle itself. But um, where we are today, uh, you're absolutely right. Like when people buy NFTs, I even heard this said in a, a space the other day where it was like, people don't even want to mint a free mint nft at this point unless like for real they're going to get something out of it just because a they're frankly not sure it's a scam or not given the crazy uh you know market but um th they also just not sure they want to spend time on trying to figure it out so people right now in the current market are looking for very specific utility right they want to know exactly what they're going to get out of this um, you know, how can they use this to probably generate yields, um, maybe play in a game as well, obviously, but, you know, marketing is number one in the space. So I, I, I think that, you know, the, the NFT cycle where we are today, um, is, is very, very much focused on like, how do I make money with this NFT? And I think that's a hundred percent a product of the current, you know, I, <laughs> pretty strong, you know, uptrend that we've had over the past two or three weeks here in the market. And I think that people are just really focused on the digits. Whereas obviously when the market is down, you got to tell yourself the story. You, you got to say you're in it for the community. And hopefully you are. I, frankly, I think most of them are. Like, I, I know that I actually really enjoy a lot of these guys. So um, I think it's just a product of the market cycle. Things go up. People want it to go up harder. So they're, they're looking for more yield. Kind of bold question per se. How do you think the future of everybody being more online, more connected is going to entail? Because I keep making the argument to people like, hey, you know, you could go out, go to a restaurant. You have to tip a whole bunch. Food takes forever. Let's just take out, stay at home. You know, have the door dashes, the Uber Eats, the, all the kind of stuff. And it feels like we're getting more and more secluded to kind of how it looked in Ready Player One, where we saw everybody in their place. They threw on the VR headset and they just kind of chillaxed. How close do you think we are to that? reality and how much of a role do you think the blockchain is going to play in it 
Oh man, I, I, I'm so biased on this question. It's not even funny. I don't know when the last time is I left my house. I, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I locked myself in here. I'm glued. I'm inside of this machine. Um, my, my wife, bless her soul, obviously has feelings about that situation, but she's, uh, she's obviously a great support system. Um, but no, look, I, I think um, at the heart of it, we are nowhere close unfortunately, to either a true metaverse or a true blockchain slash decentralized variant of the metaverse. And that's not necessarily like, um, it's not even a, a, a like a community or a philosophical demand problem. It's really just a tech problem. Like we, this stuff is still relatively new. I know people like to complain a lot. They're like, Bitcoin's been around for 10 years and it still doesn't have a use case. Like this thing is dead, it's useless. And it's like, no, first of all, I think that's absurd. And secondly, like 10 years is actually still relatively short in the grand scheme of things. And so I, I think that, you know, from my perspective, how far away are we from, you know, like a true ready player one and or uh, I, I would even, you know, go to say that something just like your neighbors living inside of DeFi to the degree where they are paying for stuff using Aave yield, I would frankly also call that the metaverse i know some people may disagree with me but like if you get most of your life inside of a digital nation i i would call that a metaverse but i think that in in either one of those capacities we are still so far off from mainstream adoption um and that's a good thing right you know for for us here who are relatively early obviously it's painful sometimes to weather the downturns but i think that in the big grand scheme of things the direction here is uh it's it's unstoppable like you it, it's it's a completely unmistakable direction the world will continue to digitize everything will continue to you know be this kind of tug of war between corporate interests versus decentralized interests um, and there's frankly going to be, you know, a lot of cash to be made on either side of that barrier. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, within the next two to three years, do we see a metaverse and or a, a ready player one type experience? Or does my neighbor, you know, get a credit card that starts paying for McDonald's using Ave yields? No, I think probably not. Um, but, uh, you know, five to 10 years, maybe, right? Like maybe one of those two, two things would actually pan out. So I wrote a little bit of a list here of some just general topics because I didn't know when I was going to be able to do that. But it's it, honestly, it's awesome chatting with you and I appreciate you taking the time. And I want to do end on uh, Captain and Company right quick. But I want to kind of just get your general thoughts, maybe in like 60 second answers, because I got a few of these different things here. Um, but to start here, the ETFs impact the ETFs impact on the market. 60 seconds response. What do you think it is? Uh, it's huge. I think that anyone fading the ETFs at this point doesn't understand um, how out of the loop retail is at this point. Uh, the the inflows that we've seen over the past month or so, I think have honestly been moderate, but I'm not really indexing on that. I'm indexing on the much longer tail opportunity, which is that these rails are now in place, the floodgates are open, and I continue to expect the multitude of trillions of dollars that are out there to continue to trickle in nice and slowly. NFTs getting completely rinsed with the broader crypto market pump. Uh, I, I, what do you expect? I mean, the, those things have, you know, crazy, crazy high beta versus the market. So, yeah, I, unsurprising. I mean, if you want to make a ton of cash, try to time the bottom. If you don't want to lose a lot of cash, maybe maybe stay out of the, the, the monkey JPEGs and the shit coins. Trend of many collections making Fortnite experiences. I love this one. This is this is honestly one of my favorites. So uh, the day that UEFN came out, I made a tweet that said UEFN is game of the year. I still stand by that. I think this is hugely slept on. I think every game should be doing this. And I think that honestly, the biggest winner here, it's going to be the 14 to 16 year old kids who can actually build this stuff. They're going to be making a ton of bucks. I and mean, I, if, if any of you have, you know, younger siblings who are building companies, building these things, hit me up. I'll invest in them. I, they're they're the builders of the next stage. Another trend of projects that are launched on other chains covering something else, but now additionally launching on ordinals. Oof. Yeah, the ordinals thing is interesting. Um, I don't think it's a flash in the pan. And I'll admit that I was actually one of the ones who faded it the first time. I was like, oh my God, not another weird tech thing that we have to get into. But no, I, I, I think ordinals is here to stay. I mean, if only from a cultural perspective, um, it has actually done a really good job of capturing attention. So uh, I'll, I'll admit, like I, I've even thought about launching a mini game for CNC over on ordinals and we might still do that. So yeah, that's, that, that trend is here to stay.
Amazing. All right. Well, there is a quick little three ones for anybody that's watching here live. We do have more and we'll, we'll bring up some of the other ones with the other guests. But as we're kind of wrapping up here, Das, can you give kind of a quick rundown of what Captain and Company is? I know we already went over that, but just for anybody that might be tuning in a little bit late, uh, your involvement with Cap Games and, you know, the, the amount of backing uh, and just kind of proving to people that you guys are going to be a force within the space. Yeah, of course. So Captain and Company, uh, it is a pirate MMO sim. Uh, you are either a captain or a crew member on a ship. You go out into huge multiplayer naval battles. Uh, you should imagine it's basically like if you took Assassin's Creed Black Flag and or Sea of Thieves and you distilled down that core game loop into a really compelling casual and mid-core friendly experience. It just takes minutes to get out there on the sea, start blasting up other pirates and steal their stuff. Right now we have a massive promotion going on because we won Blast's mainnet Big Bang launch contest. And what that means is that just by playing Captain and Company, you can earn a ton of M Blast, which will ultimately convert into Blast's native Layer 2 token. Uh, we have no idea when that's going to be, probably around May, but it's going to be a pretty hyped event. So we're really stoked to be doing that with them. Uh, we also have full staking and DeFi functions on Captain and Company. If you're really more of a whale type individual, what you can do is just hold a bunch of the ships, stake in the staking protocol, and you'll actually earn a bunch of blast emissions for doing that as well. So it's a very comprehensive um, you know, game economy where we've tried to design it for uh, you know, the base level players, the collectors, the DeFi farmers, we've really, really, you know, tried to go out of our way to, uh, you know, tip our hat to each one of those guys. And then bigger picture. Um, so Captain and Company is our first game out of our studio. Uh, Cap Games is our studio head. Uh, so it's both a distributor and a studio. On the distribution side, we run the site cap.gg. It has over 120 plus games on it. Each one of those games has generally a mobile or a browser slant. Uh, and we are also partnering with some industry heavyweights to bring games, for example, uh, things like Shrapnel or other, you know, Unreal really heavy games uh, into the browser so that people can play them there too. So we are Web3's largest browser slash mobile distributor. Uh, and we, we're, we're expecting to continue that, um, you know, as the space keeps growing. Importantly, our investor base uh, is wild. So we have investment from groups like Solana, Polygon, Near, Algorand, HBAR. Uh, we are probably one of the largest cross-chain ecosystems to date, um, and we uh, we do plan to be rolling out quite a lot of new features, both to um, you know cap holders as well as uh, you know captain and company participants here over the next six to nine months is when you should expect. So um, yeah, look, it's a uh, it, we're we're still you know very very early uh, in development and ecosystem build here. So this is a great time you know just to kind of build the awareness and make sure that you guys know what's going on. But Captain and Company in and of itself is on a phenomenal tear. Uh, I mean, after winning the the Big Bang Blast competition, uh, reception has been insane, and we're going to be listing that thing on all Web two stores, Epic Game Store, Google Play, etc. About six to nine months out from now when season three starts. Uh, and at that time, I really do expect this thing to go ballistic. So, um, no, th this has been a ton of fun, Shelly. I really do appreciate you guys having us on. Yeah, of course. So if you guys are wanting to follow them, it's at Cap'n, well, Cap, letter N, cap and N Company. Yeah. <laughs> we have it up here yeah. on the screen if you guys are wanting to. And then for uh, Das Capitalist, at Das Capitalist GG. Sir, thank you so much. I really hope that we can do this again soon. You've been insightful, and I appreciate you taking the time. Absolutely, Shelly. You guys have a good day. Yo, peace, peace.